Okay, everyone, hello. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, can you wave your hands about? Awesome, excellent. Bit of audience participation, nice. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to this short training event. Um, it's going to be about Galaxy Australia and um, it's used as a tool for assembling and annotating genomes. My name's Jeff Christensen and I'm from the Emble Australia Bioinformatics Resource or commonly known as Emble ABR and I'll be your host for today. And my colleague Christina Hall um, from Emble ABR is also behind the scenes co-hosting this webinar with me. Um, so Emble ABR, if you don't know what it is, uh, we're actually a distributed national research infrastructure and we provide bioinformatics support to life sciences researchers in Australia. So it was set up to maximise Australia's bioinformatics capability and we currently have 13 nodes across Australia, each of which you will be um, uh, affiliated with in some way. And, and each of these nodes undertake or support bioinformatics research and activities around several key areas. And these are data, compute, tools, training, platforms, and standards. So um, obviously, one of the major priorities across all of the Emble ABR um, and, and one of the six key areas is bioinformatics training. And this is why um, Galaxy Australia has partnered with the Emble ABR nodes um, that you're associated with to deliver this training, uh, a series of training events. And the first of these is today. Um, we have 110 attendees registered across these 10 sites. So across five states, which is, a, which is just fantastic. I, Wanted to thank the people that are facilitating in, at each of your nodes. They're doing a fantastic job um, helping us to deliver this training. Um, anyway, today's short uh, introductory training session, we're going to explore Galaxy Australia. Um, so Galaxy Australia is an open access, free to use portal for Australian life science researchers. Um, it's for data manipulation and analysis. And we're going to specifically look at how it can be used as a tool for genome assembly and annotation. So, the trainer today, the lead trainer is Anna Syme. So uh, she's the bioinformatics training lead on the Galaxy Australia service, and I'm sure she'll give a little bit more of an introduction into what the Galaxy Australia service is. Um, and she's based at Melbourne Bioinformatics at the University of Melbourne. Um, and she works there on microbial genomics. So her previous research um, includes studies in crustacean biology and systematics, uh, mapping the evolutionary gain and loss of complex characters, and using molecular data to investigate speciation rates of taxonomic groups such as Australian grasses. Um, apart from at the University of Melbourne, she's also worked at Museum Victoria, University of California, Santa Barbara, and the Royal Botanic Gardens, Melbourne. So before I hand over to Anna, I'm just going to mention a few logistics and how that you as participants can get involved in this session. So obviously, uh, we're using video conferencing today, and Anna's going to be delivering the content over the video conferencing. So all of the sites around the country will pretty much remain muted as you are now. Um, and that's just to stop background noise because it's very annoying when there's multiple conversations going on over the video conferencing. However, at certain times during uh, the session, and these are marked in the, in the schedule that uh, you, you should have the link to, um, the facilitators at your site uh, can, be, can request to be unmuted so they can speak um, one on one with Anna to um, ask any questions that you, your site may have. So, hopefully, uh, you have also been given some post it notes. If you haven't, it's not a disaster, but if you've got them, they're pretty useful. Um, we have taken this trick from Software Carpentry where they use post it notes to indicate whether everything's going well or whether you need some help. So, basically, if you have a problem, um, stick your pink post note somewhere clear, clear on your laptop or something so your facilitator can see it and they can come and help you. And again, this just is a lot simpler than lots of people calling out at once. It just works better. Um, so in addition to that, we also have uh, what we're calling a discussion board. And again, this is another, another idea that we've borrowed from the software carpentries where they use a collaborative space where anyone who's attending can edit a document, ask questions, answer questions, so on and so forth. So um, that is visible to everybody. And again, there's a link to it at the top of the schedule. So please feel free to ask questions um, 
and use it as we go. Um, I'll just point out that we do have a code of conduct, so there's a link to that at the top of that document as well. And basically, it just says, you know, please be nice, don't, you know, don't uh, be rude and cause trouble. Um, if you do, um, obviously, you know, that's not that that behaviour is not welcome at at um, MLABR events. Um, and finally, uh, if you if you miss something today, it's not a disaster. What we're doing is we're actually recording this session, so we're already recording it, edit it, and select the parts that we broadcast via um, the Embel AVI YouTube channel. Um, that's the link there. And we'll provide all these links to you after the training has um, happened. Okay, so now what I will do is hand over to Anna. So I will, there we go, and I'll mute myself. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, can you all hear me okay? <laughs> Great, okay, that's good. All right, so to start with, I'm gonna talk about the workshop that we are going to do today. So as Jeff said, we are looking at an introduction to Galaxy Australia. And to help introduce Galaxy Australia to you all, we're going to look at some of the tasks we might commonly do in bioinformatics, such as genome assembly. And we'll also have a look at genome annotation. So as Jeff said, my name's Anna Syme. I'm based here at Melbourne Bioinformatics. And no doubt you've met your local node facilitators or you will meet them um, throughout the afternoon. So looking at our objectives today, what we're aiming to do in this workshop, um, there's four main goals. Firstly, obviously we want to familiarize you with Galaxy Australia. And to do that, we're going to look at genome assembly and annotation. We are going to use bacterial data today because that's obviously a lot smaller than some of the larger eukaryote data sets. Um, we'll use a real data set, but it will be cut down in size so that we have time to run our jobs. And we will demonstrate how to use some of the common tools in Galaxy Australia for these tasks. So a couple of disclaimers though. Uh, we will be introducing genome assembly and annotation, so I'm not assuming any background knowledge here, but obviously in the time available, um, it'll be a very short introduction. But hopefully that will cover the main points so that we understand what we're doing in the tutorial. We are using bacterial data, so no eukaryote data today, but I have put some links into the tutorial page um, with some relevant articles that might help you if you are using eukaryotic data. And the general principles uh, for genome assembly are the same. And we're using some of the common tools. So I think we're using four tools today, but uh, we won't cover all the available tools in Galaxy, but you can also have a look at those when you're working in Galaxy Australia. So we'll cover what Galaxy Australia is, then we'll register and log in, and then we'll do our hands-on exercises in assembly and annotation. As Jeff said at the start, this is the um, web address of the schedule that we're working with. So if you can have that open in a tab in your browser, that would be useful because it has the links to the slides and the tutorial material. Uh, the workshop's going to run for three hours uh, and we'll follow the schedule uh, fairly closely. Some of the timing is approximate, so obviously we we'll, might run a little bit faster or a bit slow, slower in some places, but we'll follow the order in that schedule and we will definitely finish before um, four o'clock at Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, for each topic, we will do a brief slide introduction, then the hands-on exercises and after each topic, we'll have a 10 minute break. So you can either have a tea break then, or you can finish off any exercises you were working on, and then we'll resume after those breaks. Um, as Jeff said, please use the discussion board uh, for any questions you have. You can ask questions there or answer questions there, and I'll be looking at that and hopefully get a chance to answer some of your questions. Uh, I'd like to thank a lot of people involved in making this possible today. In particular, I'd like to thank all the local facilitators. Um, 
their help and support in running this at all the nodes is has what is what's made this possible so thank you very much to all of you um, the Galaxy Australia project is part of a, a project called the Devil Project and there's lots of people involved in that behind the scenes. So thank you to Gareth Price, who's the project manager, and a lot of the people working on making Galaxy work. So Simon Gladman, Igor McCoonan, Derek Benson and Ewan Gunaskera. And in particular, I'd like to thank Christina Hall and Jeff Christensen for all their support um, making this possible. They make it all run very smoothly. And we're using some training material today that a lot of people have contributed to throughout the years. So I haven't listed all the people who've contributed, but I would like to acknowledge that um, their support in adding all this material over the years. And finally, thank you all for coming. So as Jeff said, we do have a lot of supporters for Galaxy Australia, um, a lot of funders and supporters. So thank you to all these organisations. Okay, so now we are going to have our introduction to Galaxy Australia. So some of you might have used Galaxy before. Um, if you haven't, Galaxy in general is a web-based platform where you can do your bioinformatics analyses. So there are lots of Galaxies in the world, um, lots of different servers, but they all have the same basic look, which is we have a tool panel on the left and a history panel on the right. So basically on the left are all the things you can do and on the right is a, is a history of all the things that you've done, the files that you've used, the tools that you've run and the outputs from those tools. So it's web-based. It's designed for biologists to work with their own data. There are lots of tools in Galaxy, so we'll use some of the common tools today, but there are a lot of tools available and it's a work in progress. There are always new tools being added and tools being updated. Uh, one of the best things about Galaxy is that it keeps this history of all the analyses that you've done. So it keeps a record of not only the tools that you use, but also all of the parameters you used when you ran those tools. So that's a really nice feature and it makes it really easy to rerun any analyses that you've done, particularly if you want to change any of the parameters, and it makes it easy to share your analyses with your colleagues. Today we are working with Galaxy Australia, which is usegalaxy.org.au, and this is one of the um, major Galaxy servers in the world. Two, two of the other big ones, obviously, is the main one called usegalaxy.org, and there's also a European usegalaxy.eu, uh, and there are lots of other smaller Galaxy servers. Galaxy Australia is um, a new Galaxy server which is born from Galaxy Melbourne and Galaxy Queensland. So you might have used either of those servers in the past, and now they've been amalgamated into one um, Galaxy instance. So the features of the Galaxy page, we have um, the address of the Galaxy server in the top menu bar here. So that's how you get to your Galaxy that you want to work on. We have our tools here in the left hand side. You can either look for a tool under the topics or you can enter a tool name in the search bar and search for it. We have what I call the centre panel. This is where the tools param tool parameters um, are set, or if you're looking at one of your output files, this is where the file will appear. In the right-hand side, we have our history. Currently in this history, you can see that it's empty, but if you had files in here, they'd be all listed in a row. And there's also this top menu bar, which has a lot of useful things. So we'll have a look at this in a minute when we register but there's also an option here to get shared data or to get help. So Galaxy is great because it gives you your own space to work. I do recommend checking the data storage policy on any Galaxy server that you're working on. So for Galaxy Australia, there's a link here that's also available on the um, homepage of the Galaxy Australia uh, website. So your history is saved. Um, which makes it really easy to rerun analyses or to share your data. So when you work with Galaxy, the main bit you have to be worried about is the web page. Um, 
But if you're interested in behind the scenes, uh, what's happening is that uh, that web interface is sending any information to a web server. <coughs> Excuse me. That sends jobs to a cluster and then your jobs will run in this compute cluster and that will send the output back to the web server and then back to the web interface. So you interact with the web page, but there's obviously a lot of compute going on in the background. It's very simple to get started with Galaxy. You just use a web browser and enter in the address of the Galaxy that you want to go to. If you haven't used that Galaxy before, you need to register. And then each time you use that particular Galaxy, you should log in so that you can see your previous data. <coughs> Excuse me. So the way that you use it is that you upload your data, you do your analysis, and hopefully you get some great results, and then that's all well and good. Getting data in, there are lots of ways to get data into Galaxy. You can get it from your local computer or a remote computer. Today, we will look at importing data from a shared data set. <laughs> so the tool list is on the left-hand side. So this is usually grouped into categories. So you can either search under these categories or you can enter in the tool in the search bar here. When you click on a tool, it brings up the tool interface, which is here in the centre panel. And that's where you enter in any parameters that you want to use to run that tool. Then you click the execute button and then any output from that tool will appear on the right hand side. <coughs> Excuse me, got a bit of a cough. So any output from your tool, as we said, will appear on the, the right hand side, but also here will be any files that you've used. Um, and this will be called your current history. And you can have multiple histories that you can use. Galaxy has a, a coloured system for the files. When you enter in a job to run, it will be grey while it's queued, yellow while the job is running, and green when it's finished. When you have a, an output file in Galaxy, you can click on this little eye icon and that will bring up the file in the centre panel here. <coughs> Um, we're not going to touch on Galaxy workflows today, but they are a really useful part of Galaxy, so I wanted to mention them. And this is a way where you can easily create workflows by stringing together tools and input and output files. <coughs> There's some quite useful buttons in Galaxy that I wanted to mention. There's the refresh button here. There's the view all histories button here in the top right. This takes you to a screen showing you all your histories. And we have some expand and collapse buttons on the um, lower right and left hand sides. <coughs> so Galaxy is part of the BioDevil project, which is um, the Bio Data Enhanced Virtual Lab project managed by Gareth Price. And this is building on the GVL, the Genomics Virtual Lab. And the aim of this project is to provide features of the core Galaxy servers with um, tools and references that Australian researchers might find particularly useful. There's a map showing the various main Galaxy servers and how they all use the same reference data and tool containers. So now we're going to um, get started with Galaxy. So if you can open your browser and in one browser tab, if you can go to usegalaxy.org.au, And in another tab, if you can go to this training page. If you want a quick link to that training, um, in the schedule, if you click on <coughs> log in to Galaxy Australia, that will take you to the training page. And then I recommend having both tabs open if possible. <coughs> so, for example, I've got my training page here.
and I've got my Galaxy page here. And that's just an easy way to see um, what you're doing. On the training page, um, the top uh, little three bars um, shows you all the training options. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to go to get started. Okay, so at this point we should all have our training page open and our Galaxy page open. Oh, I've got a cough, sorry. <laughs> um, just ask your local facilitator if you can't get onto either of those pages. Okay, so now we're going to get started in Galaxy Australia. <clears throat> so as, we, as we've said, Galaxy has the tools panel and the history panel. I'm just going to scroll down here to the login section. I'm just going to have to have this for my cough, sorry. So what we're going to do is I recommend using Safari, Chrome or Firefox, not Internet Explorer. So if you can type in the address of Galaxy Australia. And then we want to go to the user tab and select register. If you've used Galaxy Australia before, then click login. Okay, so enter that information to log in. And then I recommend refreshing the page. So I should mention here, if you're using a different Galaxy server that you haven't used before, you would need to register separately for that Galaxy server. So in my Galaxy page here, I've already got a file in my history and we won't use a tool right now, but I'm just going to show you quickly. If I wanted to use a tool, I'm going to use a tool called FastQC that we will actually use later today. And I would execute after I checked the settings. And then my tool would run and you can see I've got two output files here. They're currently running. And when they finish running, they'll turn green. And then if I wanted to look at those files, I would click on the eye icon. And just to repeat, um, I just wanted to mention this useful button to view all histories. You can see my files are finished now. So if I wanted to look at them, I would click on that eye icon. But we'll look at that more in, de in detail a bit later. So to view all histories is this top button here. If you haven't used um, Galaxy Australia before, you won't have any histories existing, but I do. So if I click on this button, you can see it shows me all of the histories that I've done before. And then to get back to the main page, you can either click this Galaxy Australia here in the corner or just analyze data. So either of those should take you back. Okay, so hopefully everyone logged in okay. Um, if the facilitators could let me know via chat if there's any problems, but 
I will assume that all is okay. Okay, so I think we'll start now on um, de novo genome assembly. I do apologise for my cough. It has just come on the worst possible time. <clears throat> Okay, so today we are going to be looking at de novo genome assembly. So de novo means um, from new, which means we're assembling a genome just using the reads themselves and not using a reference genome. And I'd like to thank lots of people who have contributed to these slides. Um, Simon Gladman, Torsten Seaman, Dita Bulak and Ira Cook. Um, so thank you to all of them. So firstly, we want to see why we want to assemble genomes. And there are obviously lots of reasons that we'd want to do that. But I think two of the main reasons are that we want to understand the actual structure of the genome. How many genes there are, how they're arranged, uh, what repeats there are, where they occur. And this sort of information, we need to have an actual assembled genome to get that information. Secondly, we might want to compare genomes uh, between two samples or two species. So that's probably a lot easier to do once they're assembled. So if we have two um, assembled genomes, we can start comparing them, see what sort of differences they have, either at the nucleotide level, so individual mutations, or even larger structural differences. Obviously, most genomes in the world are unsequenced. Um, this slide might be getting a little bit out of date, but as an example, uh, in eukaryotes, if there were 9 million species, we only have about 3,000 assembled genomes. And in bacteria and archaea, where there's probably billions of species, we have, we have a lot. We have 600,000 assembled genomes, but still in relation to the actual number of genomes that exist, it's, it's quite small. Genome sizes vary a lot. So bacteria are usually about one to five million um, base pairs. Humans are about three billion. And I was curious about the um, largest genome. So I actually Googled that and there's a flowering plant that is 150 billion base pairs. So there's a huge range. And obviously that affects your assembly tools and um, methods. So ideally, we would have our DNA from our um, species that we wanted to assemble. We would put it in a sequencer and we would get back the sequence that was complete for however many chromosomes were in our um, species. So in bacteria, that might be one chromosome. Um, but depending on the species, you'd get a full sequence with no gaps and no breaks. Obviously, in the real world, we can't do that, mainly because of the way sequencing technologies work. So we have our genome, and we need to break that into short fragments so that we can actually send them through the sequencer. This gives us our sequencing reads. So these are our short, um, well, short to long sections of nucleotide sequence. And these are stored in what we call FASTQ files. <clears throat> so we'll be seeing some of these in our tutorial today. So in a FASTQ file, the main part of it obviously is the sequence, but then we have also some information about the sequence quality. So in a FASTQ file, we have the sequence ID, the sequence, and then a lot of information here about the quality. So we won't go into that in too much detail, but it's good to know that that information is there. And we'll have a brief look at that when we do a quality control.
and the files we're using today are concatenated FASTQ files. So <clears throat> it's a list of um, the sequencing reads all in one file. So in de novo genome assembly, we're trying to re reconstruct the original genome just from the sequence reads. So we're going from millions of short reads into ideally one or a few long sequences. And as a, an analogy, you can think of um, a pile of newspapers, shredding them up and trying to reconstruct one. So we take our DNA, we break it into lots of pieces. <clears throat> and in a general sense, what we're trying to do is to sort of overlap all those reads and get our consensus. So the way that um, a lot of genome assembly tools work now is with assembly graphs. So this is the tool we're using today uses assembly graphs. So what this does is it breaks, actually breaks the sequence reads into smaller fragments. <laughs> um, and the size of these fragments can be um, chosen by the user. So they can be called size K. <clears throat> and then the actual fragments of the sequence read are called K-mers. And the way assembly graphs work is that it actually overlaps these K-mers by one base. It only overlaps them if they're an exact match. And the reason it does that is that it's quite computationally um, efficient. Once these have all been overlapped, it makes a graph called a de Brown graph. And then the aim is to find a path through this graph, which is sort of your consensus sequence or your contig. So it can get quite complicated, but it's good to know um, what the tool's doing in a, in a very general sense. Here's a rep representation of that, showing how the reads or, or the k-mers are overlapped, connected, and then a path through the graph is found. Here's another picture of that. So the reads or the k-mers overlapped and then a path. So what we're doing in our tool today is we actually enter some values of k for the k-mer size. <clears throat> can be tricky to choose the right value for K and there is no one right value, but uh, computationally, it's probably a good idea to have a few small, smaller values of K and larger values of K because these result in different graph structures. <laughs> so if we have small k you, you can see that there'd be lots of overlaps and you get a lot of joining. But if you have large k you might get fewer overlaps, but it'll be much easier to find an unambiguous path through that graph. So the tool we use today, we actually use several values of K and that tool makes um, several assembly graphs and merges them together. Obviously a big problem in genome assembly is the problem of repeats. So we can see here we have lots of reads. <clears throat> These are our little bars. And when, it, when we have a repeat, if our read length does not span the length of the repeat, we cannot place it unambiguously in a contig. So what often happens <clears throat> is that the reads that match to these repeats get collapsed into a single contig. So in this case, you can see we'd actually end up with four contigs. One, two, three, four. So that can be a big problem. Um, the way it would look in, in a graph is that we would have, we'd have a bubble in a graph. So you'd have this region here leading to one of the repeat regions, leading to the green region, back to a repeat region, and then onwards. <clears throat> so when we look at our assembly graphs and if we find bubbles like that, they can often be from repeats. If you have long reads, which is getting more common these days with things like PacBio or Nanopore, these can span the repeats <clears throat> and that can solve a lot of problems. Although some repeats are still very, very long, so can't fix all the problems. 
So in summary, when we do de novo assembly, we reconstruct a very long sequence from many short sequences. <clears throat> and we just do that from the information in the reads themselves, not from comparing to a reference genome. Um, and that can be particularly important for things like bacteria, where there are a lot of things that won't match closely to a known reference, or because they're evolving so quickly, so you might want to see the current status of the genome. A common way to do genome assembly is with these overlap graphs called the brown graphs. Uh, and one of the biggest problems in assembly are these repeats. Uh, but there are a couple of other issues that can cause problems, <clears throat> like sequencing errors or sequencing bias. Okay, so we might get started now on our genome assembly exercises. <laughs> So once again, here are the links to uh, use Galaxy and to the training. So we are working here on genome assembly. <clears throat> so I'll pull that one out. Okay, so hopefully everyone's got both of these tabs open. <clears throat> I'm going to um, start a new history. <coughs> Sorry about my cough. So I just went to create new. But you probably have a, um, a history there that's ready to use, an empty history. So we're going to use a tool today called Spades. So the read set today is from a bacteria, <coughs> Staphylococcus aureus. These sequencing reads have been produced on an Illumina um, sequencer. In this case, we're using paired end reads today. So we have what we call an R1 file and an R2 file. These are reads that have been sequenced from each end of the original fragments. <clears throat> so each one of these files is one of those multi-fast queue files. And our reads are 150 base pairs long. <clears throat> we're going to use shared data today. So we're going to go to shared data. data libraries. <clears throat> so scroll down here and look for Galaxy Australia training material. And then assembly. And then microbial assembly. <clears throat> Tick next to each of these files. Um, up the top here is a two history button. <clears throat> Select as data sets. I'm just going to use my current history or you can write the name of a new history. Then click import. So you can see now I've got these two files <clears throat> in my current history. So I've included a section here in the tutorial about how you can get this data from the web, <clears throat> but we can ignore that for now because we have it from the shared data. So these file names are quite long, so we're going to shorten them. If you click on this pencil icon, and then shorten the name. I'm just going to keep the last part. 
and then save. And I'm going to do that with the other file too. Okay, so we now have our two FastQ files. <clears throat> Let's have a look at them. Click on an eye icon on one of the files. So you can see here, this is a FastQ file. <clears throat> It's our reads and their quality scores. And it looks a bit complicated, but um, it is, a, it is um, a section of all of our reads just in a concatenated file. So there's one read here, one read here, here, and so on. And the same in our R2 file. So we're going to do a quality control check of our data. I've put a link in the tutorial to another tutorial. You can either get that from this link or you can get it from the top menu. So here we're going to use a tool called FastQC. We already have our files. so skip down to run FastQC. Just going to wait while we all catch up. Okay, so hopefully we've all got our two files. Just a reminder of where I got them from. I got them from shared data, data libraries, Galaxy Australia training material, assembly, microbial assembly, and these were the two files that we ticked and imported. And then we change the names of these files <clears throat> with the pencil icon. This pencil icon is quite useful. There's other things you can do here. You can change the data type of your file and various other things. And now we're going to run <clears throat> the tool FastQC. So I'm going to type this tool name into the search tools. So I type it in and I see that there's a tool here that I want. So this brings up the tool in the center panel. I'm going to use my R1 file. <clears throat> so you click in this drop down box, choose the file you want to analyze. Just going to wait for a minute while we catch up. Is 
a few facilities. There's a few people on their feet. <coughs> Um, while we're waiting um, for a minute here, I just wanted to point out when you use the tool, um, there's often a lot of information underneath it. So that can be a good way to see <clears throat> what the parameters mean and where you can get more information um, about the tool. So here in FastQC, <clears throat> We can see it describes the tool, um, talks about the inputs and outputs, and um, has a reference. Okay, so if people are renaming files, just a reminder that you click on the pencil icon, you find name, and you shorten the file name. So delete the parts of the file name you don't want, and then click save. So this is not essential, it just makes it a bit easier to work with. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at running FastQC. So if you open your um, training web pages and go to the menu, you'll see quality control. So we don't need to import the data because we already have it. So scroll down till it gets to run FastQC. And then back over in Galaxy, in the search tools box here at the top, enter in FastQC. 
Now we can see a tool here that we want to use, so click on that. <clears throat> I'm just going to hide my side panels to make my screen a bit bigger. So here we want to analyse one of our FastQ files. You can use um, Mutant R1 or Mutant R2. I'm going to use R1. And I don't need to change anything else here, so I'll just click Execute. Let me know if anyone wants me to repeat those steps. So you can see my jobs here are, are running. Yours might be grey if they're queued. They might be yellow if they're running, or they might be green if they've finished. Let's look at the web page output file. Clicking on the eye icon. I'm going to hide my side panels again. I can see some of you are still queued, so they should finish in a minute. And this is some of the output that you'll see. I won't talk about this in too much detail today. I just wanted to show you the graph. You can see we have a graph here. Um, even if yours are still queued, when it's finished in a minute, um, you'll have a graph in your output file. This graph uh, the x-axis is the position in um, the reads, so our reads are 150 base pairs. And our y-axis are the quality scores. So we can see for our read set here, they're all in the green area, which is good quality. Um, and the best quality in the reads seems to be in the middle towards the, towards the end. They seem to be lower quality at the start. So I won't talk about that a lot in detail, but I have added in a nice reference I found um, about lots of common sequencing problems, um, quality control problems. So that, that could be a good resource if you want to look at that in more detail later. So hopefully most of yours are finished and went green. And just to remind you, I clicked on the, the eye icon of the web page output. And that showed me lots of information. In this case, we can see our reads are quite good. And we are not going to do any trimming of our reads because they all seem to be quite good quality. This would vary depending on your analysis. So we'll go back now to our assembly tutorial. So what we did is we uploaded our two files, we did our quality control check, and now we are going to assemble our reads. So you don't need to change your history. This can all exist in your same current Galaxy history. So back in Galaxy, in the Tools box, we're going to search for a tool called Spades. So I can see the tool here. <coughs> So this brings up our tool interface panel. <clears throat> it's where we set all our information. 
we're going to leave most of the settings um, the same as they are as their defaults here because they're appropriate for our analysis but we are going to change some things so firstly this run only assembly let's make it a bit bigger so click on the yes here we just want to run the assembly so that should be darker grey. The k-mers, so when we were talking about our graphing and we had to choose these values of k, um, we're going to choose them here and we're going to have 33, 55 and 91. Don't put any spaces in when you type them in. Coverage cutoff, we're going to select to auto. And then we have to tell it what files to use. <clears throat> so we're all the way down here in files. We have to tell it the R1 file for the forward reads and the R2 file for the reverse reads. We don't need to change anything else. So we can go all the way down to execute and click execute. So because a lot of us are doing this job at the same time, obviously a lot of us will be in the queue and that's how Galaxy works. So you might have to be queued for a little bit before your job runs. So we're going to have a break for um, 10 minutes. Well, not a, um, a tea break, but just a, a break while our jobs run. And this is a time for you to ask any questions that you want to ask in the discussion board. Um, and I'll be here uh, answering those questions. So just to repeat what we did, um, if you didn't get your jobs to run, <clears throat> we search for spades in the tool panel. We clicked run only assembly. We entered in our KMAS in this KMAS to use spot. So we entered in a range of KMA values. We did coverage cutoff auto. <clears throat> and then we have to tell it the files to use. <clears throat> Make sure you haven't accidentally given it the same two file names. We want R1 and R2. And then we click to execute. Um, let me know if anyone wants me to repeat any of that.
So the discussion board's going really well. Thank you everyone to, for asking and answering questions. Um, a lot of people are asking how you choose um, KMA values. <coughs> so there's no perfect way. Um, so what we like to do is to choose a range of K values um, that sort of cover the span of the read size. So our reads were 150 base pairs. So we've chosen K values sort of from the shorter side, about 33, and on the larger size, about 91. And, and this is because of the way that the tool will construct the graphs. Um, and when you have smaller values of K, you'll have a lot more overlaps. And when you have larger values of K, you'll have a lot more, um, you'll have less ambiguity in the path through the graph. So both of them have, um, both of them are useful. And instead of just choosing one KMA size, one of the good features of the tool that we're using today, Spades, is that it actually, I, I think this is how it works, it constructs graphs based on the three different sizes and it actually does something tricky with merging those graphs together. So um, it's quite a good way to get the benefit of um, small and large KMA sizes. Um, another question we have is about the um, results from FastQC. So in the tutorial, um, there's a link to some output files to compare your results to. Um, and so it's quite comprehensive, the site, and they've got examples of what good data might look like from a quality control perspective and bad data. So. I recommend looking through that website and comparing your results to their um, commentary. We'll just wait another five minutes or so for everyone's jobs to finish running.
Okay, thank you for your questions. Um, keep up asking those and I'll have a chance to answer some more of them a bit later, but also thank you to all the question answerers. That's looking good. Um, I think Simon said there were no um, jobs running anymore. So um, everyone's jobs should have run and they should have green files in their output. So if your job is finished, finished running, you'll have uh, five output files. We're going to look first at the contig stats file. So find the file that says spades on data two and one or whichever numbers were your files in your galaxy history and then contig stats. Okay, so this is an overview of what spades assembled from our FastQ reads. <clears throat> so you can see um, yours is probably the same. Uh, you probably have eight nodes or contigs and we have a list here of the lengths of those and the coverage. So mine is ordered by length. I think everyone's will be the same. Let's make it a bit bigger. So you can see that I've got one quite long contig, um, some smaller ones and then some very small ones down the bottom. <clears throat> uh, the coverage for most of these contigs seems to be around about five. But we also have some contigs with much higher coverage. So we have some a 10 and a 12 and a 28. <clears throat> so this looks like it might be, you know, double our normal coverage and, and node six looks like it might be, <clears throat> say, six times coverage if our base coverage is five. So has everyone got those results from spades? <clears throat> So you can see in an ideal world, if our bacteria has one chromosome, ideally we'd have one contig, but uh, it's not an ideal world, especially with short read data. <clears throat> so we're gonna have a, a little bit of a look in more detail at, at some of these contigs. So let's look at contig number six or node six. Um, and let's blast the sequence of that contig on GenBank to see what it matches. So to get the actual sequence of this contig, we need to go to our faster file. So in your output, find contigs faster. Click the eye icon to view that. I'm going to use command F <clears throat> to find node six. So I'm going to select that <clears throat> sequence, copy it. Now I'm just going to do a basic blast search. So if I search for NCBI blast, and I'm going to do the blast X search. So I want to see <coughs> uh, the translation of this nucleotide into a protein. So I'll paste the sequence in here. I need to choose the bacterial genetic code. So that's code 11.
and in this case I'm going to look in the database of Swiss Prosh but you could try a different database if you were interested to see the differences. So just to reiterate, I went to my context fast file, I searched for node 6, I copied that sequence, I went to NCBI Blast, pasted it in, chose code 11, and a Swiss Pro, Swiss Pro database. <clears throat> then click Blast. So Blast can sometimes be slow. <clears throat> you might just have to wait half a minute or so. So it is a little bit slow today. <clears throat> so this is one I did earlier um, while we wait for them to finish. Okay, Adelaide's having trouble accessing Blast, that's okay. I'll just show you what results you would see. <coughs> um, in this case, this is what you would see if Blast was working. Um, so we put in our query sequence, which was node six, which was our contig that had this quite high coverage. And we can see the top hit is to a transposase for ins an insertion sequence like element. So insertion sequences um, are a little bit like small transposable elements. Um, so it's likely there could be a lot of copies of these in the genome. And this might explain why this particular contig has a lot of coverage um, because it could be a repeat region that as we saw in our assembly could have been collapsed into one contig. So um, we can start to get more information when we look at our contigs and try and work out what they are. Okay, so some of you might be having trouble getting Blast to finish, but <clears throat> that's what you would see if um, Blast was working. You'll see that it matches to this insertion sequence like element. Um, and if you're interested, you could repeat this another time uh, with a different database to see if your results were any different. I'm sorry, Blast is not working for everyone. Um, we've just got a little bit more time for this tutorial. So <clears throat> I just wanted to mention if, if um, if your um, particular exercises did not work today, um, there's a way to access the history of this tutorial in Galaxy and to see all the output files. So that's listed here in the tutorial about how to get it. You would go to shared data. I'll show you in Galaxy what I. Okay, so if you wanted to access all of the files, we go to Shared Data, Histories, and then I'm going to search for Assembly. 
So I've uploaded this history and called it completed assembly analysis. And you would find that history and this button would say import. And that's how you could get the files of this history. <coughs> uh, and I'll mention one more thing before we have our break. Um, I did mention br briefly that Galaxy is quite useful in creating these workflows that you might want to repeat. In this case, we've done a really simple series of steps, so our workflow won't be super complicated, but if you wanted to extract the steps in, in your history into a workflow, it's very easy to do in Galaxy. I've written how you do this in the tutorials. I've called it Workflow Genome Assembly. But all you really do is you go to your history in Galaxy you click on this cog icon and you click extract workflow. Then you would check all the details of your workflow were okay. And then you would click create workflow. Then click this little button called edit. And this brings up the workflow, what we call a workflow canvas, which is a grid. And you can drag things around to arrange them a little bit better. But you can see that this workflow shows what we did. We had our two input files. One of them we sent to FastQC. Both of them we sent into the tool spades and then we got our output files from Spades. So then I'll click Save. So I went to this cog icon to save. And then you could run the workflow at another time. So I'll click Galaxy to go back to the main page. Okay, so we're going to have a 10 minute break now. Um, this is a chance for you to either finish off uh, those exercises if you want to, <clears throat> or to ask any more questions in the um, discussion board. Um, and we will come back online at 2.30. Okay, thanks everyone.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, just while we're waiting for everyone to get back from the break, I'm going to have a look at some of these questions. Um, we have a question, uh, who has determined which tools are presented in Galaxy? So um, if you want a new tool on Galaxy that's not already on there, have a look at the home page. See if I can bring it up here. And there's an option here to request um, installation of a software tool or a reference data set. So put your request in there. And if it seems to be a useful tool or reference data set, uh, we hopefully could get it installed. Um, we have another question uh, about the contigs and the scaffolds uh, in, in, Gall in spades output. So when we ran spades, uh, we seem to have these files, some of them said contigs and some of them said scaffolds. And in our case, uh, I think both of these are the same. Just look at the scaffold stats. Um, so this has not been used in this analysis, but it's something that um, scaffolds are, are joining the contigs together into larger contigs or called scaffolds. So if there was more information about how to join those contigs together, perhaps from other experiments or other data, um, the contigs could be joined into larger scaffolds. I don't think it's used a lot anymore, um, well, particularly with bacterial um, assembly. Yes, yeah, so what we see is our contigs and our scaffolds are exactly the same. So that's why we're just using contigs. Um, there's a question about how much space you get on Galaxy. So uh, I think the answer is 100 gigabytes of space um, if, if you have an EDU AU email. Um, there's a data storage policy on the main Galaxy page. Um, here under the, the user data storage policy. So click on that to get the, um, the full detail about storage. Um, there's a question about um, more information about workflows. So we had a quick look at that with extracting the workflow that we did with assembly. But in the, um, in the tutorial page, you can find a little bit more information. <coughs> um, there's tutorials down here, a, a general one on workflows and specific ones on extracting workflows. Um, the way we did it in the tutorial was we extracted it from a history, but you can also start with a blank canvas and drag tools and files in and create your own workflow. Um, this is probably a good chance to mention some other Galaxy training material um, at the Galaxy Training Network. So I'll just show you the uh, web page for this. So we, we, we've been developing some Australian specific Galaxy resources here on the pages that we're using today, but there are some global resources that we also um, contribute to and borrow from. So if you Google the Galaxy Training Network, you'll find all of the resources here. And there's a lot of great stuff on this site. So um, there's a lot of material organized by topic and um, more general Galaxy 
tutorials. So I highly recommend that site if you're looking for more training. And if it's not covered on our site, then have a look on the Galaxy Training Network. Okay, we might start on our um, genome annotation. Okay, so like Sorry, my Zoom quit, but I think that should be working. Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, sorry, I think I lost my screen. Okay, great. Um, where did it go? Okay, I might not make that full screen because I think that's making it crash. Okay, so for our very brief introduction now to genome annotation, um, and thanks again to Simon, Torsten, Dieter and Ira for these slides. So firstly looking at bacterial genomes, uh, they're very small uh, when comparing to something like a human genome. So. If a bacterial genome is say one to five million bases, um, the human genome is about three billion or double that because we have um, deployed or two copies. But bacteria are very, um, what we call coding dense. So there's a lot of genes packed into that um, genome. So they're a lot closer together than they are in something like a human genome. So these are the sorts of things that we want to keep in mind when we're annotating a genome. We want to know some general information like that, the overall size and, and what we might be expecting in terms of the arrangement. So annotation in a, in a very general sense is just applying information onto that genome sequence. So um, that can be either for a human audience or a computer audience. So making that genome sequence um, more informative. And the way we would do that is firstly, obviously we need to assemble a genome and that's what we've done already in our workshop. We um, assemble that into contigs and then we start labeling areas on that sequence. So in our case, we ended up with eight contigs and here's a representation of how your genome may be in lots of pieces. So you might have lots of contigs in the example on the left, or if you had a really nice genome assembly, perhaps you had some really long reads, you might have um, it all joined together in one piece in the case of bacteria, which have one, often have one large circular chromosome. So in our case, we've got eight contigs and that's okay. We can still annotate these contigs. So when we annotate, we are adding biological information to the sequences. 
So one of the most common things that we would do in a genome annotation is to label areas that are coding sequences, so CDS areas that code for particular um, proteins. So here we can see a whole area of green that's been labelled as CDS. But there are other features on the genome that are obviously interesting to us. So we might have a ribosome binding site. We might have some RNAs, such as a transfer RNA down here. We might have things that we don't know if they're um, interesting or not, but we might label them um, for later use. So here we have a tandem repeat. And here we have a homopol homopolymer. So we have a run of all of the same base. And that may or may not be interesting, but we might want to annotate it anyway to, to work it out later. So the two main things in an annotation, and obviously I'm summarising a lot here, but uh, basically where is this feature and what is it? So when we look at where it is, we need to say which chromosome, where exactly in that chromosome and what strand. And when we look at what it is, we might label it um, a protein coding gene, and we might give more information to that annotation. So we might say that it's, we know it's a gene that um, makes alcohol dehydrogenase, and we might add notes, so we know that this is a gene for beer processing. Today we're using a tool that does automatic annotation. And when we use tools like this, um, again, I am um, summarising a lot, but the two basic pieces of information that a tool would use to do automatic annotation are either the sequence information itself, so the string of nucleotides, and we might um, use that to blast to some database of known um, sequences. But we can also use some of the structural information in our genome. And we can use um, models to model um, whether areas might be coding sequences. And we can also find things like transfer RNAs. In bacteria, often uh, the main things we find are uh, CDS areas. So this is the region between a start and a stop codon. Um, there might, might also be partial genes and pseudogenes. And the way we find these are we either align to known proteins in databases or, like I said, we can model, um, we can predict which areas might be CDSs. We can easily find transfer RNAs because they're very conserved. And we can also fairly easily find ribosomal RNAs because they have some conserved regions. Today we're using a tool called Proca, and this was developed by Torsten Seaman, and um, we'll use that within Galaxy. So in a, <clears throat> in a really simplified sense, Proca takes in our contigs, so over here on the left, and it runs a whole a lot of other tools. So it's a wrapper for all these other tools, um, those tools and various databases and then it predicts or um, identifies certain features on our bacterial genome. So uh, perhaps our tRNAs or our CDSs. And then it um, puts an output file with all that information in it. So that's what we're going to do now in our annotation tutorial. So what we've already done is we had our bacterial data, we got our sequencing reads in FASTQ files, we assemble them into contigs. We've now got eight contigs, and we're sending those contigs into Proca, and we'll get them labelled with information. So in our Galaxy training pages, this is the genome annotation tutorial. So I'm going to start a new uh, history for my um, for you, my tutorial. So I'll go into Galaxy 
and I'll go to this cog icon in the history options and create new and I'll click on the unnamed history area and name it annotation. Um, be sure to press enter so that it loads the name in. This is not essential but you can do it if you want to do it. Okay, so we've talked about PROCA. There's some information there at the start of the tutorial. So as we said, PROCA takes in contigs. Um, if you already had contigs in your galaxy history, you can just load them into that new history. So what we're going to do is look at all of our histories. So in the right hand top button here, uh, it says view all histories. You can either just continue working within your assembly history and that's fine to just work within that or you, if you've made a new history, we can drag our contigs faster file over into that history. So this is this will be our history with our contigs faster file. And I'm going to show you in a minute how to get that file if you don't have it. So it's a, there's various options here. You can just be working in your existing history with all your spades results and that's fine. You can have started a new history called annotation and put your contigs faster file in it. Um, if neither of those work for you, we will get a contigs faster file. So I'll show you how to do that now. So in, in the Galaxy top menu button, go to shared data, go to data libraries. And again, we're going to look through for this file. So everything for Galaxy Australia is stored under Galaxy Australia training material. So scroll down a bit. Galaxy Australia training material, click on that. We are now looking at annotation. So click on annotation, microbial annotation. And we just want the top file here. Oh, we might actually, I'll just check if we need that second file. I think we'll just get the top file, which is the contigs faster file. So click next to that. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Where are we? Then click the to history button. So import that to your history. And then you should have that in your current history. You don't need to rename it. Um, so if anyone hasn't got a contigs file in their current history. Uh, could a facilitator just let me know on the chat window? But otherwise we should be okay to keep going. You can shorten that file name if you want. Okay, so now we're going to run the tool called Proca. So in the search tools, I'm typing in PROCA, P-R-O-K-K-A, -K -K and I find it here. And this is a really simple one today. All we're going to do is tell it that the contigs we want it to annotate are our contigs faster file. We're not going to change any other settings. and then we're going to click Execute. So although we didn't change any settings today, I have put a note in the tutorial about how you would choose or change settings when you run a tool. Um, like I said before, when you read about a tool, there's usually a lot of documentation underneath that tool interface panel. So highly recommend if you're doing your own data analysis that you look in detail at that documentation to try to work out 
how the settings apply to your data. But in our case, uh, we know that these settings are appropriate for our data set. So just a reminder, if you need that contigs file, we got it from shared data, data libraries, Galaxy Australia training material, annotation, microbial annotation, and we took this top file, the contigs faster, and we imported that to our history. And then we searched for Proca in the tool panel, and we told Proca to use that contigs file, and now Proca's running or queued. So even though Proca hasn't finished yet, we can set up our next um, analysis that we want, which actually uses some output from Proca. So we're going to use a tool called JBrowse. So search for that in the tool panel, JBrowse, all one word. And select JBrowse Genome Browser. So we need to set up a few things here. So what we're doing with JBrowse is we're making a, a visualization of our genome annotation. So it's a nice way to view all the things that have been labeled on our contigs. So I'll just make my screen a bit bigger. So we've searched for JBrowse. Now we need to tell it some of the things to do. <coughs> so for uh, reference genome to display, this very first option, click on the drop down arrow and choose use a genome from history. We want it to tell, tell it to use the um, FNA file, the Proca FNA file. Uh, your one may have different numbers, it may say Proca on data four or something, but the, the main thing is it needs to say Proca on data something dot FNA. So search for that in the drop down menu. Okay, I'm just waiting for um, I'm just going to wait a minute while um, Galaxy reloads for USQ. <coughs> okay, that seems to be working now. Okay, so um, we'll start from JBrowse again for, for USQ. So what we did was in um, Galaxy Australia, uh, so we'd set Proca running, so that might have run or it might still be queued for you. That's fine, we're not going to look at the output yet for that. So in the toolbar, we're going to search for JBrowse. And we're going to select JBrowse Genome Browser. And I'll just make my screen a bit bigger. Okay, so now we have to tell JBrowse some other things to do. So firstly here, we need to tell it which reference genome to display. And we want it to use a genome from history. So click that drop down box and go use a genome from history. And then we have to tell it which genome. And we're going to use one of our Proca outputs which is the Proca FNA file. So you might have a different number here, Proca on data something, but as long as it's Proca on data something FNA, that's the file we want for our reference genome. 
We're not going to change too many things in here, so you can leave most things as default. Scroll down a little bit to genetic code. And here we want to tell it to use the bacterial genetic code. And now we're going to set up some tracks, which are the sort of the lines of information that get displayed on our visualization. So let's click insert track group here with the little plus next to it. Just make it a little bit bigger. So click insert track group. We will give it a name. So under track category, let's type in uh, gene annotations. And then we will click insert annotation track. And for track type, we will keep it on this GFF features. So there are lots of options there, but we will keep it on that one. And then the actual data we want it to use for that is our proper on data something GFF. So I'll just repeat some of that. We used reference genome proper FNA. We used the genetic code 11. We inserted a track group called it Gene Annotations. We inserted an annotation track, GFF features, and we chose the file Proca GFF. And that's all we need to do. So we'll scroll all the way down till we find Execute and click Execute. So that will probably go into your Galaxy Q. Um, JBrowse can take a long time to run, um, perhaps 20 minutes or so. So it's possible our JBrowse jobs won't finish in time, in which case I'm going to show you how to get that, um, that same file from a shared um, data um, library but we'll set it running and we'll wait 10 minutes while everyone's jobs, um, Proca and JBrowse run. Um, and then we'll, I'll explain how to get the files if your jobs didn't run. So while we wait the 10 minutes or so, I'll keep looking at the questions. Um, and please let me know if anyone wants me to repeat any of those Proca or JBrowse uh, instructions.
So while those jobs are running, um, I just wanted to make the point that obviously the, the tools we're running today and, and the um, options we're setting in the, um, in the parameters for the tools, we're using quite a simple example. And that's so that it runs in time and so we can just get you used to the idea of using the tools and, and for them to work and not take too long. Um, obviously things can get more complicated in bioinformatics when you have larger data sets, um, different tools. So I guess we wanted to show you the, the sort of the easy way, but also not sort of not promise that every analysis will be this sort of one button, um, you know, an analysis. So often you will need to go into the tool manual, manual and look at the um, documentation about the parameters. And, um, and sometimes, obviously, the answer won't be super clear about which parameter to use, and you might just have to try some and, and see how that affects your analysis. But hopefully with Galaxy, it makes things a little bit easier. So nothing's ever going to be just one button, but hopefully this sort of visual interface and, and the, um, the recording, the histories, hopefully that adds a little bit of ease to your analyses. Uh, in the tutorials for assembly and annotation, I have added some references, uh, like I said before. So for genome assembly, it's not exhaustive, but I just uh, selected a range of references that sort of cover the general principles of assembly. Um, some other tools that uh, do assembly, such as Canoe, um, Abyss 2.0, um, some papers about uh, eukaryotic genome assembly, uh, plant, particularly plant genome assembly. Uh, and there's a, there's a paper in here talking about um, a really nice tool called Bandage, which we won't look at today, but that's a really nice tool for visualising your assemblies. So I think with spades, um, one of the output options you can select whether to have a graph that you can view and that's something that you can view in Bandage just on your local computer so you can download it locally and then upload it to Bandage. So I highly recommend that tool if you want to visualise your assemblies in more detail. And then for genome annotation, we've also included just a range of references. So today we've uh, use bacterial genome annotation, but obviously things get a little bit more complicated with eukaryotes. Um, probably wheat is the most complicated thing ever. <laughs> so um, there's a paper there about that. And But there are also other tools uh, that might be useful for checking whether your annotation was good or not. So there's a nice tool called Busco, uh, which is a, is a good way just to sort of assess whether your annotation um, has found most of the genes that you would have expected to find. So I'll just wait a couple more minutes um, for people's JBrowse jobs to run.
Okay, so uh, it's likely your JBrow job, uh, JBrow's job, has not finished running, which is is what we expected. It would probably take another ten minutes or so to finish running, but because we're impatient, <laughs> let's see if we can get that file. Um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to import the history of this whole tutorial, which has the JBrow file, JBrow's file in it. So uh, within Galaxy, if you can go to Shared Data histories. So before we went to data libraries to get some data, now we're going to histories. So shared data histories. So I'm going to search for the history called annotation. So there's a history I've put on here called completed annotation analysis. So click on that and up here it should say import this history. Mine says switch to because it's owned by me, but yours should say import. So click that. I'm just going to get my history um, from another spot, but uh, hopefully you can get that shared history from there. taking a while to load. Has everyone been able to access that history okay? Oh, yeah, it's just taking a little. Oh, yep, that's right. So I'm doing it a different way, but just to reiter reiterate what, what we did to get that history was we went to um, shared data in the top panel. We went to histories this time, not data libraries. And then we looked for completed annotation analysis and we clicked on that. And then we, that should say import. You should have an option to import that into your, his, your current history. Okay, so hopefully everyone should have that history. So 
Um, you might now have a very big history in your current history pane, that's fine. What we're after is our JBrowse file. Um, so that should hopefully be at the top of your um, current history. So let's click on the eye icon next to this file. I'm going to make my galaxy screen bigger by clicking these arrow buttons at the bottom of the two panels. So you can do that too. And sometimes it just takes a little while to load um, because it's full of information. Oh, it's taking mine quite a while. Just going to press the refresh button and try it again. Okay, if yours was if yours was having trouble loading, you could maybe try that refresh button. Okay, and again, I'm going to collapse the two side panels. Okay, so hopefully everyone has loaded into their centre panel. Let me know if that didn't work okay. So what we need to do is click on this track here in the left-hand side. So... Um, Proker on data one GFF file, and we've got our reference sequence already ticked. So we have these um, two tracks displayed. Now, um, Proker also shows you one contig at a time. So that's this first box here, and we want to be looking, I think, at our longest contig. So that might be displayed by default, but if not, have a look at the drop down menu and look for the longest contig. So in my case, it's node one. Uh, it is probably displayed by default. <clears throat> so um, JBrowse has the zoom in and out buttons. So I'm going to zoom in with the plus button. So what we can see is these blue bars here are our gene, genome annotations, or most of them are genes. Uh, you can click on, on that to get more information. So I've clicked on a gene and it tells me its name, its type, so this is a CDS, and various attributes about it. I'm going to zoom in more with the plus button all the way to this uh, reference sequence. So we've got the reference sequence here right in the middle. And then we have the six frame translation happening either side of that. So it can be a little bit busy to look at. I've got a, a diagram here on the tutorial page showing how that center part is the DNA and then we have our amino acid translations either side. So you can play around in JBrowse, zoom in and out, um, just to get this sense of how many genes have been annotated along our contigs. So all of these little blue bars are our um, annotations. We've just got a couple of minutes. I, I might just show you um, something else you can do from here. So in this case, uh, we're going to copy a sequence from one of these annotations and have a look at it in GemBank. So in this um, second box here, 
I'm going to enter some coordinates. Uh, so I'll, I'll enter 32,500. This is just so if you're following along, we'll, we'll, we can all use the same ones. So this is our coordinates here. And if we look at the annotation that spans th this coordinate, um, we can click on it. So there's nothing special about this gene in particular, but just so that we could all use the same one to look at. So this one has been annotated as a hypothetical protein. So not much information has been attached to this annotation. So let's have a look at it a bit more. We've got the actual sequence of this um, gene down here, or protein, gene for the protein. So let's copy that sequence. and have a look at that in BLAST. Uh, once again, we'll use uh, BLAST X. So if you Google NCBI BLAST and click on BLAST X, then we can paste that sequence in here. Um, again, we're going to use the genetic code bacteria and in this case, we'll also use Swiss Prot as our database. And then we will blast this. So this may also take a few minutes. Oh, well, mine came up quite quickly. <laughs> um, so what we can see here, yours might still be running, but when it finishes, and if you happen to use the same sequence that I did, uh, you might find these results where we can see that the sequence that we've taken, which was annotated only as a hypothetical protein, we can see it actually matches to this conserved domain um, of metallo-dependent hydrolases um, in this top box here. So we can actually click on that and get a lot more information about what that superfamily is. You can click through and it's really detailed information. So we can learn a lot more about what this um, might be coding for um, and what its function might be. So I guess the, the point of that is to show that sometimes with genome annotation, um, depending on which databases have been searched and, and how um, comprehensive they are, we might not get um, all the information that we need. So we can do a bit more manual investigation to find out more information about uh, some of those annotations. So if your BLAST uh, search is still running, that's okay. Um, and if you used a different gene, that's okay too. It's just a way to show how you can find more information about annotations. So uh, that's the end of our um, genome annotation tutorial. Um, once again, you can uh, extract that workflow, as I showed before, for assembly. And I won't go through that now, but there's information in the tutorials about how to do that. So you can go to workflow genome annotation. So we're going to have another 10 minute break uh, and you can have a break at this time or uh, finish off those exercises and we'll come back at 3.30. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, thank you for all your great questions in the discussion board and your great answers. Uh, I'm just going to answer one question here. Um, why are there so many output files from Proca? That's a good question. Um, so I wanted to show you in Proca, when we ran Proca, we actually had the option to select which output files we wanted. So I'm just going to show you the Proca um, tool interface. So here when we put all our settings into Proca, down the bottom, we had the option to select or unselect all these outputs. Um, and we, by default, we selected all of them. But you can see here an explanation of what all those outputs are. And if we didn't want them, we could just unselect them and, and choose the one we wanted. So uh, generally, you'd probably want most of them. But um, there's the description of what they are. And they're described in more detail in the um, Proca paper or on the Proca GitHub. Okay, so I will just move now to our um, summary of today's uh, tutorial. Just do a final check for questions. Okay. So just a, a brief summary of what we did today, uh, where we looked at Galaxy Australia, uh, and in particular genome assembly in Galaxy Australia. So our object objectives were to familiarise you with Galaxy Australia using these tools for genome assembly and annotation. Uh, obviously, we could only use small data sets uh, from bacteria, uh, but hopefully, hopefully some of the references in the tutorial um, can provide more information about how you might use larger data sets, um, and hopefully the principles involved in assembly and annotation are fairly universal. So we covered four common tools used for assembly and annotation. So we covered uh, what Galaxy is. So some of you might have used Galaxy before, but for some of you it might be new. So we learned that Galaxy, uh, you can access it from a web page. There are lots of different Galaxy servers, but there are some main Galaxy servers. And of those main servers, um, Galaxy Australia is one of them. But all of them have the same general format where they have the web page with the tools on the left and your history on the right. So we use Galaxy Australia, and there are, as we said, other Galaxy servers. Uh, the main Galaxy server is usegalaxy.org. But some of the advantages of using Galaxy Australia is that the queuing time is usually uh, less than using some of these other ones. Um, and we just have a bit more flexibility in installing the tools or the data sets that we might want to use. To get to Galaxy, we enter the address of the Use Galaxy Australia server, so usegalaxy.org.au. It's free to use. Uh, it does store your data if you're logged in, but do check the data storage policy. And I just wanted to reiterate some of these useful buttons, uh, particularly this View All Histories button here in the top right of the history pane. So that will show you all the histories that you've worked on and you can switch between histories or you can even drag files between your histories. And if you need a bit more room to see what you're doing, you can collapse these side panels with these arrows at the bottom corners. What we did today was we had some bacterial data. So these were sequencing reads in FASTQ files. So these were the sequences with the quality scores underneath. And we assembled these reads into contigs. And then we sent those contigs to another tool and we labeled parts of the contigs with information. So we used the tool spades to assemble these Illumina FASTQ reads. We got several output files. We were just looking at the contig files today because in our case, the contigs and the scaffolds were the same. 
And in particular, we looked at this contig stats file. So that gave us a list of all the contigs that we found, the lengths of those contigs and the coverages. So we saw that our longest contig had a coverage of about five. And we saw that one of these shorter contigs had a coverage that seemed to be about six times coverage that we would have be expecting in our assembly. So when we sent that contig sequence to GenBank Blast, we found that it may be one of these repetitive elements. And that may explain uh, why we have such a high coverage. It may be that this is a repeated region and because of our um, short reads in our assembly, it has collapsed it all into one contig. Then we looked at genome annotation. We used the tool Procker. And we, so we got our contigs from spades and we sent them into Procker and we made a JBrowse file that will show us our annotations. So it's a really nice way to see all these labels um, on, our, on our genome. A lot of them were genes. Some of them are hypothetical proteins. And if we zoom in on JBrowse, we can see that reference sequence and the translations. We also had a quick look at one of the hypothetical proteins um, and we put that on, onto um, a blast in GenBank to see what that matched and we got a little bit more information about it and found out that it was a particular class of enzyme. So in a general summary, using Galaxy, we've gone from these FastQ reads, which was a file that looked like this with all of our sequences in it, to an annotated genome. So if we want more information on those things, like I said, there's the references in the tutorials. And also I showed the um, Galaxy Training Network. Uh, so if you're looking for more information that can't be found on Galaxy Australia Training, have a look at the Galaxy Training Network. Uh, we work closely with them and try to share materials. So um, they've got a lot of great material there. And we do have some further upcoming workshops uh, throughout 2018. So keep an eye out for those if you want to look at Galaxy and look at some different tools and um, different analyses. Uh, so once again, I'd just like to do a particularly big thank you to all of the um, people involved, the DEVIL project people, um, EMBL ABR support, and in particular, all the local facilitators. So I really want to thank you all for um, running these workshops at your local nodes today, because um, without you, it wouldn't be possible. So. Thank you very much and thank you to all our funders. So now I will uh, send back to Jeff Christensen. Great, thanks Anna. Um, and thank you Anna for uh, leading this training today. Um, so I, uh, let me just share my screen. I guess before we do that, I guess there's still uh, a bit of editing going on in the collaborative document. I'll just say that we're not going to um, delete that document. It's going to remain so you can revisit it and have a look at the answers um, into the future. So, and um, I think some of the some of the questions will, will will maybe answered over the next few minutes as well before we wrap up. Um, okay. So first of all, uh, as I said, thanks and. So Anna, that was a that was a really good event. Um, thank you to all the attendees for coming. Um, as I said, I think we had 110 people across 10 sites, so that's pretty impressive. Um, we're pretty happy with that. Um, and also, thank you, uh, as Anna said, to all the facilitators at those nodes. So, um, without your help, it wouldn't be possible to do this. So, um, as Anna said, um, we there's three more workshops planned. Uh, through the EMBL ABR network about Galaxy Australia. So the next one is Variant Detection. It's on Wednesday, the 12th of September, same times. Um, if your node is listed there, um, this is already available for you to register. So um, if you go to embolabr.org.au slash about slash events, uh, you'll see this page and there'll be links, all of that. Um, you so you can just sign up sign up for those already um we're also going to have uh if you're interested in 
uh, November, we're going to be hosting a UCSC genome browser training event as well. Um, so just keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, um, and also, uh, this is being recorded and once we edit it, um, uh, it will be available on the YouTube Emble ABR um, website. So just a couple of things before um, you leave. Uh, I thought it went well, but it doesn't really matter what I think. What really matters is what you thought as participants in this, both participants and facilitators. So um, I just draw your attention at the bottom of the discussion board, there's a link to a survey. If you could please take, I think it only takes a minute or two to fill it out, that would be really useful. And we're interested in your candid opinions on content, um, but also that this method of delivery. So um, so anything we'd like to know, you know, what worked, what didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So if you could fill that out, that would be uh, wonderful. And um, finally, uh, Anna had mentioned some uh, support that the Galaxy Australia uh, project um, receives from IRDC through the uh, Data Enhanced Virtual Laboratory Program. I'd also just like to say that Emble AVR is supported by uh, Bioplatforms Australia, Byron Australian Government and Chris Investment, and also by the University of Melbourne. So um, we would like to acknowledge uh, all of those organisations for making this possible. Um, so great, thanks very much. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month. All right, thanks very much.